we are babies and kids, we touch, we use our bodies, we use our arms, fingers, hands to interact with the environment. And this is how we understand what's going on. Kids play, play games, and these games are highly physical. Babies use their mouth and tongues to try things out, and they understand through texture and shape what are these objects. Um, all these have to do with the ability of playing around and interact with the environment that is just there, just in front of us. And turns out that engaging our bodies with these activities promote thinking. If you look, infants are actually pretty good in solving complex problems. Problems like mazes, finding the solution to a maze, playing with puzzles, moving the parts and putting them together. They are successful on that. Why? Because they engage the body with the decision making. And this idea that we play in order to to think is something that comes naturally to us. We don't need to learn that. In fact, when we go through the formal process of education, kindergarten, elementary school, and so on, in a way we forget about all what we knew. We unlearn these skills. We become more thinkers and less doers. But the whole point here is that we can actually learn better by doing, by interacting, physically interacting with the environment. And this is related to a theory. So this is what happened with kids. This is what happened with, with babies. They interact, they touch, they play, they move things around, OK? Uh, this is related to a theory called the theory of embodied cognition, which was proposed originally by George Lakoff in the 80s. And it's a theory that claims that all the aspects of decision making and cognition are affected by the way that we interact. And you can look, there is plenty of examples of that. One example is the classic example of the outfielder baseball player. This guy can be there where the ball is at the right time, at the right place. Of course, you can describe the trajectory of the ball through kinematic equations, differential equations, but this guy is not computing all these equations to get there on time. There is an intuition there going on, right? And, and, and these people are very successful doing that. Uh, but this is not unique to people. It happens with animals too. If you put a mouse in a maze and put a source of food, they're going to use whiskers and locomotion to find the solution to this maze. So this is pretty incredible. This happens too with other animals. You can look at pigeons, where they are going to peck Sometimes they can describe trajectories for the shortest route in a path. Those are complex mathematical problems that these animals are very successful solving. So these examples are all related to the theory called embodied cognition or the theory of embodied mind. And if indeed it's true that action and physical engagement promote thinking, are there out there jobs and tasks that are complex, that are difficult to perform and engage and involve really physical action? So look, for example, there is surgery. Surgeons use their hands to interact with the environment, they use their hands to operate, to interact with the patient, to interact with other surgeons, to interact with nurses. At the same time, there is a lot of decision making going on. And we believe that this theory is true. But as new technology is entering the operating room and hospitals, there is the risk that these technologies are not promoting physical action. And this is what my research group and myself took over. Make sure that we come with new technologies, we come up with new technologies that will promote the use of the body, of the physical actions, and through that encourage thinking. So we look into a first challenge, which has to do with infections. It's a huge problem right now, infections in the operating room. How to avoid these infections? These infections in occur as a result of touching objects. Surgeon is uh, it's, uh, contacting surgery and wants to browse medical images, x-rays, MRIs. May need to go to the keyboard or to the projection uh, wall closest to, to the patient 
and interact with the images. He cannot do that, he will be breaking sterility. So he will delegate the task to the nurse or to a surgical technician, and he will have to do this for him. So he will have to browse images, go to the left, go to the right, crop, zoom in. I want to look at this region to see where this particular part is. We came up with the first system called Chestix that allows a surgeon to interact with medical images without leaving his place close to the patient. This is done through hand movements. So the surgeon can move left, right, up, all kinds of gestures, and through these gestures, the surgeons can interact with the medical images during surgery. What you are seeing is the first neurosurgery that involves this type of touchless interaction. And as you can see, the system is robust to light conditions. Light works with, a, with light, without light, with a number of surgeons around, with only one surgeon. It's pretty robust. Of course, now you can tell me there is the Kinect. The Kinect can solve all these problems, can recognize movements. My kids play with that technology. It's good enough. You still have challenges there. How you can tell whether the movements of a surgeon are intended to operate or to interact with the machine. Intention recognition. So here is where we go back to the theory of embodied mind. The answer is look at the context, and the context is defined by the way that we use our body. Surgeons use their stance. Of course, they stand straight when they want to interact with surgeons or they want to interact with the machine, and they actually incline when they want to operate. They look at the screen where they want to interact with the machine, right? So intention recognition, it can be done looking at context. And of course, there are other challenges around. As you can see, the robots are introducing the operating room. More and more robots are introducing the operating room. Now, the operating room of the future will have robots that are not only controlled by surgeons, but will actually be able to collaborate and work together with surgical teams. And in that scenario, we want to make sure that these robots understand physical action as good as surgeons use this physical action. What type of physical action? Surgeons use their hand movements. They show signs, they perform gestures to request for surgical instruments. This is hemostat, this is surgical scissors, this is scalpel, this is how they communicate. Now, if you want to have robots in the operating room, you better have this robot understand hand signals. And this is what we did in our project, Project Chest and Nurse. It's a robot that actually can recognize hand signals, can recognize speech commands as well, and can deliver surgical instruments as requested. Of course, there is plenty of challenges here going on. There are technical challenges, how you can make sure that the robot delivers the instrument at the right time, fast, as fast as the surgical technician, how the robot can pick the instruments accurately from a pile, so dexterity is key. Humans are actually pretty good on that. And there is the societal challenges. How you make sure that the introduction of these robots into the operating room are not going to take the jobs of people. And if a robot is going to be there to deliver an instrument, what the surgical a technician is going to do? So hopefully there are going to be new openings for, for tasks that are more challenging and more crucial, which humans are much better than robots, right? This is what we hope. And the next challenge that we took over has to do with training, surgical training and education. Now, how surgical training looks, a big part of the training is doing and learning from what you, see, what you do and what you see. So an expert surgeon operates and a resident stands in front and the surgeon shows what are the actions, and the resident look at the hand movements and tries to learn. Okay? Now, the ability to teach through action is really important. And to teach remotely is even more important. If we think of telehealth, if we think of telementoring, the ability of conveying expertise remotely, convey expertise, for example, to rural hospitals or rural regions, convey expertise in surgery to the battlefield, to a field hospital close to the battlefield. That's key. But the problem is that the elementary system cannot convey the physical presence. 
just convey voice and video. So what we took over was to come up with a design, a see-through display, where a subspecialist or a trainee surgeon can see through a display, either goggles or some type of tablet, and through, and through the tablet see surgical annotations superimposed on the patient. And these annotations convey physical action. So basically, a trainee can follow these directions and operate according to the annotations presented. And of course, this telementoring system have unique, has unique features. Another unique feature is that allows an expert mentor guide the trainee through an interaction table the size of a patient, but it can also allow a group of experts meet together and discuss and find the best way to actually remotely promote this knowledge. Uh, this system can also show through simulation what's going to happen in the future and can also record what happened so far and the trainee can go back and look at what was done in order, for example, to revise his steps. So this concept of promoting thinking and decision-making through action is something that we can embed in the technologies that we have. But the way that we program and we develop these technologies have to keep in mind that this attribute that kids have and we have as we born, which is use physical action and play and gaming to actually promote thinking is something that we need to keep in mind. So I want to wrap up and to summarize uh, this talk. And I'm going back. What we show, what we talk is the theory of embodied cognition and embodied mind, and how actually we can look into tasks that are very challenging, that require physical action, and highly cognitive, cognitively demanding, like surgery. And I show three very challenging applications. One is the application to browse medical imaging using hand signals without moving, actually. Second task is working together with robots using body language, using hand signs, using multimodal interaction. And the last one has to do with telementoring, the idea to convey knowledge remotely. But when I say knowledge, I don't speak about spoken words or videos. I also talk about conveying the sense of presence, the physical presence. This ability that we can convey the presence anywhere Convide without with the ability of conveying knowledge of what happened in the past, of what is going to happen in the future, has to do with the concept of teleexistence. And teleexistence is the ability of projecting ourselves in a different place, in a different time. And this is the challenge that we are looking at. How you can actually convey physical presence through information technology in an effective way and in a way that is going to be helpful for the trainees uh, and surgeons in this case. Thank you very much.